and a Carsa Gorgid that we haven't seen much of yet. And I'm going to look into ID right now. Okay. Hey, buddy. Um. Juliana, can you repeat the idea real quick for the glass sponge? Uh, you pluck Talid. Right. We're gonna pluck Talid. I'm not going to go much further than that <laughs> right now. No worries. Um, in terms of the Chrysogorgid, I'm Let's still I'm looking into that a little bit. <laughs> 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 well, for Paola's <laughs> data record. I'm just saying we, we're not going to get a zoom on it. We've oh, OK. Really <laughs> <it>. <laughs> I thought you were like, yeah, next topic. <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> okay, we're finishing a ship move. I'm gonna let you get ahead of it a little bit. Alright. Ahead and out. And I also want to reset the DVL next time we're stationary. Asteroid. Oh, what is going on there? Something. Lots of hydroids. Yeah. There's a metallic virtue. <laughs> Just over this next rise. I can't hear you. Roger. That's pretty. Um, yeah, so a little more about hydroids. Um, they're very small predat predatory animals, um, sometimes solitary, sometimes colonial. Um, they are related to jellyfish. Um, I believe they're, they're the larval stage. Um, but they, they have stinging cells they use to um, sting <laughs> their mm -hmm. prey. They can be found on dead corals. Um, sometimes they'll take over a coral and they will sort of like move up the skeleton. Yeah. I take back what I said about the larval stage. <laughs> No take backs. <laughs> and then we have a question um, from a viewer who just tuned in. Um, they're wondering where would you find a fireworm? Because I don't, I don't think we have fireworms in American Samoa, but we do have a lot of um, Acanthaster plantsi, crown of thorns. They're the ones who really just oh, wow. kill a lot of our corals. So yeah. Yeah, Where so would you find them? The fireworms? Fire right now, they're <laughs> all over the reef, but they usually like to hide in a very uh, hard substrate. So if ah, you get a lot of okay. rocks, they're usually uh, under them. If they're not pr predating on a coral, they are not shy. You're going to pass right past them, and they're going to be eating the coral oh, right wow. beside you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, They can get pretty big, too. Like We've seen some, maybe, like, like almost one feet and they get really thick too Ooh. and that's scary you know because if it touches you it's gonna sting like a fire coral so you don't want that near you so you could be swimming and a fireworm could just be next yeah to you. oh my god sometimes they float but not that much they're usually ah, just attached okay. to the benthic substrate right so that's a relief at least Yeah, I think there's different species all over the world. There's definitely fireworms in Hawaii, in oh, the reefs. Oh, I, wow. I don't know about any deep sea species, but maybe one of our scientists ashore knows. Because I'm trying to think if we have back home. I haven't. Um, 
I haven't seen one. Um, I think but we do have fire fire corals. Oh yeah. Um, not fireworms. I think I might be able to pull a picture. So Annie, this is like a fireworm just engulfing oh. the whole coral. And then they what? eat the polyps and just leave the tips white. <laughs> they're that big. Yeah, they're, they're that big? Wow. Thank you. Science, is there anything around here that you'd like to take a closer look at? It would be helpful for us to stop for a second and reset our navigation system. Sure. We'll take a look at that coral there. Cool. Ah, oh, you're on mute, Robert. <clears throat> I think, yeah, they circled the black coral at the top. A very interesting fact is that fire corals are not real corals. They what? are, yeah, they <laughs> actually try to cover <laughs> sometimes the shape of a coral, but they don't have any polyps. All right, what do we think this one is? Our coral expert left. It's a black coral. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a black coral. Um, Ready for this reset? Yep. I know we've seen it before, but I forgot the name. Okay. You can zoom back out. <coughs> okay. I'm going to pull up Do the guy. Do you want to look at one of these ones? Uh, yeah, those look cool. Let's look at yeah. the Victor Gorgias. That, it? that looks like a water bubble down there. No. Yeah. There's a couple of them. Yeah. Not a water a uh, water drop not a bubble Okay, Dave, do your thing. Nice. Victor Gorgia with the uh, Brittle Star hanging out. Yep, we're good. I'm carrying on? Carry on. <laughs> Is 
So Annie, how is coral diversity over in American Samoa? Um, actually really good. Um, so when the crown of thorns uh, outbreak, it began in 2009 after the tsunami. Oh, so wow. it was completely, it was destroying. Um, it was eating up all of our corals. So the National Park and um, the Marine and Wildlife agencies were trying to tackle the problem. Um, but now they're not trying to eliminate the crown of thorns. They're just trying to control the numbers. Um, and they found also that the crown of thorns also help with the diversity of our coral species. So they make space for new corals to grow. So our coral um, diversity now is really good. Uh, there's a lot of parieties, acropora, um, branching table corals. Really, nice. yeah, it's doing much better than before. Um, That's so interesting, yeah. the role that the crown of thorns plays when yeah, the population yeah. is in control. Yeah, it was interesting to actually um, hear our, our friends talk about it and hearing about their research. So if the crown of thorns was left uncontrolled, it would, it would be a negative? It would, yeah, it would have decimated our, yeah. Uh, our coral species definitely would have um, been in big trouble. Mm. Over at Palmyra, uh, Chris was explaining to us that they also do control population mm -hmm. of the crown of thorns and they use like vinegar syringe, I think, to control. Right, right. Oh. Yeah, we've never seen crown of thorns until after the tsunami hit in 2009. Oh. That's when they just showed up. Yeah, so so interesting. It was it was it is interesting. Can we zoom on this uh coral skeleton please? In the upper in? middle. <coughs> Annie, would you consider Can that you an invasive in? species? Right. Invasive ooh, that's a good question. Um what is going I'm on? I'm not too here? sure, honestly. It's a little hydro. Yeah, me neither, because it has a fossil to some extent. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about with the hydrides, how they'll sort of take over. Looks like they've just like totally cleaned this off. But it looks like there's associates with the hydroids. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, that's enough. We can move on. Right. <coughs> Ooh, pretty coral. It's a black coral. I did this recently. Hey, Samantha, um, I'm curious, what's a ship move? That's a great question. Um, so what I'm doing is monitoring where the ship is in relation to where Hercules and Atalanta are. Right. So when, let's say Hercules and Atalanta kind of get farther away from the ship, I move the ship to get closer to them so that we're um, operating within safe distances from each other. So I'm, um, I think you might be able to see my screen in the back row um, on HiPack, which is the software that we use to plan uh, the dive. So we'll put waypoints or targets along um, that we're working towards. And I am using this to calculate distances. I can see like how far we have left to go to our next waypoint. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm I'm relaying, I'm, you know, taking, uh, information from here from science and from the ROV team right. um, and this HiPack software and then relaying that to the bridge in a ship move, which is usually uh, a distance that we want to go and the direction we want to go. So um, distance and then heading is what we we say. Staropathies? Bearing, yep. excuse me. So our ROVs cannot be too far from the ship. Yeah, how, how long is the tether cable? Well, the tether between Hercules and Argus is 30 meters, right? Uh, Could it be? <laughs> and all the zoom we got? Oh. Uh, yeah, that's it. All uh, the way 
We'll never know. I think it's iridescent. I, I think so too. Just like that rock. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Dave. All part of the service. Thanks for getting us here, Samantha. Thanks for <laughs> keeping us isolated from ship motion, TJ. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Herc. Thanks, Atalanta. <laughs> Stick of pathies to the left. Bathy pathies. Uh, Crinoid, stocked crinoid, and there's stichopathies with hydroids at the bottom. Uh, Chrysogorgia and telepathies. Ooh, what's that to the right? Other oh, zoom. We have a lot of biodiversity right here. Uh, jelly there in Atlanta just Victor dropping Gorgia. down. Down. Yeah, it's just above you. you can see in Atlanta view. Yeah. Current drifted are we away. Zooming on something? Are we good? Yeah, right in the middle. To the right of your lasers. Stop saying that. <laughs> um, I think it is uh, it's slipping my mind. Swiftia. Swiftia. Hmm. <clears throat> Pink skeleton, yellow polyps. Is that a Gorgonian? Uh, yes, it is. It is a Plexarid. Yeah, that's Swiftia. Ship stop. I feel like I could do pretty well in a coral biology class for you think someone so? who's never <laughs> had a <laughs> biology class. Yeah, you're pretty good. Just by looking at so many. Yeah, right. I think that's Carsegorgia down there. Uh, Victor. That's Victor Gorgia. And that was either a crinoid, unstocked crinoid, or a. Um, my tongue. Oh, is that a, that is not a Victor Oh, Gorgia. it looks like a Victor Gorgia. Gorgia. Yeah, it I looks like Paragorgia. A very purple Paragorgia. So it's not Victor Gorgia with polyps retracted? Uh, I don't think so, because they usually have white They look so knobby. Um, Can I get a zoom on the polyps, please? No, I think it's Victor Gorgia. Really? Yeah. Cool. I disagree. Something floaty to the bottom Not left there. Not knobby enough, I don't think. No, because oh. they sort of like... Samantha got it. Victor Gorgia with polyps retracted. It's just me in the chat. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's from... I know. <laughs> Are you spoofing uh, yeah. Steve Oscovich? <laughs> Oh, Steve's uh, confirmed? Yeah. Wow, I'm honored. I feel like I just leveled up. <laughs> okay. Confirmed by Steve. Great. Trademark. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. I think it's a stock tuna kit next to it. Can I get a little more ahead before we move? Yep. This seems like a good time to talk about the importance of biodiversity. Great time. <laughs> Um, so the more biodiverse an ecosystem, the healthier, essentially. Um, each organism, or not each organism, but different organisms fill different niches within an ecosystem and they fulfill different roles and they provide different services to the ecosystem. Um, it makes them more resilient to stressors like uh, warming and air increased or decreased pH, uh, ocean acidification, uh, decreased dissolved oxygen, 
we're seeing more uh, oxygen minimum zones top? in the no, ocean. Not a top. No, no, it's it's still climbing. Yeah. Um, ledge. Yeah, and higher genetic diversity means that um, things are more adaptable over time. Uh, so there's a proposed marine sanctuary in this area that we're exploring right now. Um, this is in addition to the already existing marine national monument. Uh, so this wouldn't replace the monument uh, and it wouldn't expand it, but it would be on top of and also just outside of the monument and it would extend uh, throughout the US EEZ. Um, and sanctuaries are different from monuments and that it's sort of a bottom-up process. So uh, it's, it's very grassroots. Um, and currently they are open for comment. So anyone can go to the NOAA sanctuaries page, um, find the, the Pacific Remote Islands National Sanctuary proposal and um, yeah, put in your two cents. Say what you think, uh, if you think there should be a sanctuary or not, uh, let them know and they have to respond to all the comments. Um, all Atherian. You can also find that link on Nautilus Live. Yeah. You can also find the link on, on right. links inside there. Where on Nautilus Live can you find it? If you are okay. watching on Nautilus Live, if you're watching over on YouTube, come back over to nautiluslive.org. But if you just go down the page, just below the live video, you'll see the latest content. And there's a blog about this expedition called Returning to King okay. of Palmyra. Moving and on. inside that blog is the link. Awesome. Thank you. Ready for a ship move? I'm ready. I'm ready. Two thumbs up from our IV. Bridge nav. Three zero meters, three one zero, please. Uh, so the role we play in the the creation of the sanctuary, uh, we're providing data to the public. This will all become publicly available and. Anyone can use it. Um, researchers will be analyzing this data. Uh, the more we know about this area, the more informed we can, we are in uh, making decisions, like where we appoint marine sanctuaries, where the most vulnerable areas are. Um, and there's also uh, a lot of deep sea mining happening. And the more we know about the geology, and uh, the organisms that live in association with these features, um, the more we can we can locate where best to mine for minerals. Yep, no mining happening yet, really, no. but uh, right. in the in the future. So, uh, collecting information now about that resource and and the ecosystems that that thrive on it would. Uh, if it came to pass, would help us to, to use that resource more uh, sustainably or maybe choose where to not try and get that resource. It would be great if we didn't right. use it at all. Yeah, but it's it's underway. a tough question because the, the metals that are contained in these deposits are some of the same ones we need for a green uh, green energy future, you know, for wind turbines and battery storage and the like. Yep. Uh, so, you know, tough, right, tough choices complicated. ahead. complicated, yeah. <laughs> hmm? I'm trying to get the magnet to grab it. <laughs> <laughs> for more information, <laughs> head over to nautiluslive.org and Rats. north of <laughs> Really getting ahead now. Oh. 
Another thing is that we may not be able to necessarily protect um, biology from things like temperature rise and ocean right. acidification, um, but we can decrease the impact that we have um, on certain areas by, um, you know, decreasing the amount of activity in that area, like fishing, trawling, um, etc. cetera. Uh, and we found that in, air, in protected areas, marine protected areas, that um, corals are, corals and, and fish populations are more um, resilient to change when you decrease the amount of activity in the area. Decrease disturbance, that is. Um, it allows them to respond better to stresses like, stressors like temperature change that we don't really have much control over. What's that little yellow? Staropathies. Staropathies? Yep. Roger. Do you want to zoom on it? Um, I'm set. Should no zoom. No, no zoom. zoom? No zoom. No zoom. We coming cl close to the top of the plateau, are we? Uh, we're still about... Actually, right now we're on the North Pacific Ocean. <laughs> um, <laughs> Welcome we to are, the North Pacific. Yeah. <laughs> Again? It's yep. right beneath us. Yep. Uh, we're about 360 meters off from the uh, top of, well, from waypoint five, which is That's pretty much the top the of the top. plateau. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we do have a viewer that would like to know. Uh, my son would like to know why do corals have brittle stars wrapped around them? Mm. Um, we think that they have a mutualistic relationship. So, well, commensalist, but there's some thought that the, the brittle stars provide some service to the corals. Um, but corals are positioned uh, so that it like so that there's more like flow going through them um, that's how they feed um, and so you might imagine there's also food being provided to the the brittle stars right. that are attached to them how about a breakdown of commensalist versus mutualist yeah yeah so in a mutualist relationship um, both parties are getting something out of the relationship uh, commensalist only one is benefiting but there's some question over like whether commensalist relationships even really exist. Like like maybe all commensalist relationships are actually mutualistic relationships. That's what happens in a lot of cases. We look closer at what's happening and it turns out that both are benefiting. Um, well, they're certainly not hurting the coral. Um, I will, I'll look into that a little more and hopefully and is get symbiotic some more symbiotic mean that the, that neither can survive without the other? Um, in some cases, in others, um, they may be able to survive without the other. Like, I mean, there's lots of corals that don't have brittle stars on them and they're doing just fine. Um, we also see ophiroids independent of corals also surviving. So I don't think it's necessary, but there are certain organisms that need the other to survive. Um, like, in a lot of cases, like, the, uh, holobiont is really important to the health of the animal. Like, one thing that shallow water corals couldn't survive without is the symbiodinaceae, which is the algae associate. Mm -hmm. Um, the algae captures sunlight and provides, uh, food for the coral. And when coral bleaching happens, that's when the um, the symbiont um, leaves the coral. It's it's what provides the coral with its color, uh, aside from some protein pigments in the coral. Thank you. So, what is coral bleaching? Just for our viewers who are just tuning in. Yeah. So when the water gets too hot or too acidic um the algae that lives on the coral is unhappy and it will 
leave the coral, mm -hmm. um, which leaves them like white looking basically. And these corals, which are also heterotrophic, will um, might survive for a little while without the symbiont. Uh, they would switch more towards um, like feeding themselves. But um, in the long term, if they don't retain any of the, the symbiont or the symbiont doesn't return, they likely won't survive. It is possible to recover from bleaching. Right. Um, but the coral will, the will starve eventually. Good for a ship move. Bridge nav. Three zero meters, three one zero, please. I found an article from the Smithsonian Institution about um, brittle stars and corals. So it looks like the brittle stars are providing some benefit to the coral. So stay tuned. Then we do have our, thank you for sharing. Um, we do have a question about our ROVs. How did ROV Hercules and Atalanta get their names? Not look at me, you're an ROV. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because they mention ROV doesn't mean I know anything about Greek <laughs> mythology. Yeah, but but uh, Bob Ballard uh, mm. has, has named a lot of vehicles after Greek mythological figures and so uh, the ROV that he worked on kind of originally was called Jason like Jason and the Argonauts and this one's Hercules oh. Atalanta I don't know who that was uh, nor Argus but Atalanta uh, is the only female Argonaut. <laughs> Argus so is the watcher story. the watcher yep mm -hmm. oh that's cool Hmm. A lot going on up here. I know. I might, it's might a lot. Be, if you're not in a huge rush, it might be a good uh, yeah, EDNA definitely. spot. Uh, two Victor wow. Gargids, uh, like seven, eight. Do we want to take a misc in here? Yeah. Bridge, no? <clears throat> like in the middle so of this beautiful. stuff? Full right? position. I don't know how much it matters whereabouts, but yeah, somewhere within it would be good. Like here, maybe? I mean, yeah, yeah that's fine. <clears throat> Not unexpected to see high densities right at these kind of breaks in slope. And then go to cameras flow and here. then you port rail cam. I was uh, talking about uh, heterogeneity earlier. Yeah. Um, and how it's important for the health of an ecosystem. Uh, this also extends to heterogeneity in geological features. Um, yeah, so this is one of the reasons that seamounts are so biodiverse. Um, um, yeah. I'm going to let them do their thing for a bit. Get it with the Which one are we firing? So we can use nest game bottles one, two, three. One, two, or three.
you watching? I'm watching. I'm watching. <laughs> yep. Alright. And data, this is zero three zero. Yep. Thank you. Are we using number three? This king number three? Yeah, three. In the in the Niskin frame video there, what end are we looking at? <coughs> so the, the the furthest ones away is six. So it looks like there's five of them in the view. Okay. You can't see one. We oh, I see. Okay. One is is too close. Yeah. yeah. Anything else you want to do here, science? Any zooms? Any snips? I think you can see one, and when its lid pops up, oh, right, you just can't see it. Okay. And it's in its cocked position. Jules, you got any zoom desires? Uh, let's look at this yellow one, please. The sample is secured. Secured. Yep. Oh, already? Yep. Wow. Well, Blink can you miss it? <laughs> what, what are we talking about? The Niskin? Or the, the Niskin, yeah, the, but we wanted to zoom on that thing. Uh, so, it zoomed in. It seems like the brittle stars may push away some smothering sediments hmm. from the corals and also deter hydroid larvae from settling on the coral's branches. Oh. Um, hydroids have stinging cells which can kill the corals and you'll often find them on coral skeletons. So what do we got here? Uh, plexorid, I think. Plexorid. And at the bottom, are those arms of the coral or like lazy worms? That looks like coral arm, actually. Mm, it looks a little yellow to be the coral arm. It looks like some sort of worm or mollusk. Interesting. It's not looking like a super happy coral. Well, that's not like a bunch of hydroids on there, is it? I don't think so. Okay. Oh, actually? Mm, those are extended polyps. No okay. hydroids. Okay. <coughs> That's good on the zoom, thank you. There's also something in the background I was hoping to zoom in on. Um, oh no, that's Victor Gorgia. Okay, I don't need the zoom anymore. All right, let's keep moving. Yeah, we're good. Are you ready for a move? Bridge nav. Paula, how are you feeling with these IDs? Three zero meters. I think Three one so zero. Please. Definitely yeah. learning okay, a lot. Yay! It does. Samantha, what's our range to waypoint five now? We've got. 335 meters. Okay. And we have an hour until we're supposed to be off bottom, but it sounds like our goal is just to get there, right? So if it goes a little over 11, we need to come off, we can do that? Yeah, actually I thought we were <coughs> planning to be on deck at 1230, so I thought we could have an hour and a half maybe. I think that might be swift yeah, down there. Uh, depends on what speed we'll be coming up at. Okay. To back calculate that. Do you have any guess, Robert, what our ascent speed will be like? 23. Let me do a calculation here. Steve Oskovich says that the most updated taxonomy is Paramuricidae. 
Paramaricia, Paramaricida. Oh. That was an awfully pink coral. There's a little fishy out in the distance. Oh. I'm gonna guess Cusk Cuskiel. Yeah. I feel like you can say Cuskiel 90% of the time. Yeah. This is usually right. <laughs> Or you can say the Latin and look That's super okay. smart. <laughs> it's the Latin. <clears throat> okay, so at 23 meters a minute from 1650, which is the estimated depth at our uh, at the plateau, will be about 71 minutes. Uh, so if we want to be on deck by 12:30, so like 11:15. 11:15, yep. Okay. Well. We'll get as far as we get. I save ten minutes at the end for picking up a rock, probably. <laughs> Paula, can you tell us more about your research? Yeah, of course. So, back home, I study shallow water coral reefs, so they're a bit different from the deep sea corals we're seeing here. And the research I've been working on over the past year has been around coral, cor coral ivory, fireworm coral ivory. Really? Yes. So cool. Tell us about that. Yes, so we're having these massive outbreaks on our restoration sites where there are a lot of fireworms going around. And they eat the corals, especially the, the ones that we're trying to restore, uh, really oh, wow. fast. <laughs> so we were studying, we were monitoring them over the past two years to see if it affected coral growth, if it affected its survival. Yeah. And our results were that they actually don't affect its survivability. They actually make it better. Oh. So maybe they That's so trigger some type of defense mechanisms yeah. and something about epigenetics we still don't know. <laughs> but wow. it makes them survive better just by 10%. But 10% is 10%, right? That's huge. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. But it does make that's them so grow slower. Okay, so there's that. I had a question about um, how these corals reproduce. Are they like broadcast kind of reproducers? What, how does it work? Yeah, so corals spawn by releasing egg and sperm into the water column, uh, but they're Both also- from the same uh, from organism? from uh, it, let me look into that. <laughs> Corals are a colony, so you yeah, get they also, they're also colonial. Yeah, and so they can just break into two, most of them, and just have two corals. Mm -hmm. That would be via fragmentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so coral spawning are like these big events yeah, go down that only happens bit. at like particular times. Um, it's really cool to see. Is there a particular time? I'm thinking about um, once a year on cues from the lunar cycle and water temperature. Ah. Entire colonies of coral reefs simultaneously release their eggs and sperm into the ocean. They say it's supposed to look like snow in the water. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then they will fertilize in the water column. And Paula, please correct me if I'm saying anything wrong. No, you're good. And um, then they will settle somewhere and begin a new colony. Yeah, then the larva settles and starts growing. Does the neodymium in the van know how much of that is determined, kind of biologic group by group, on uh, on deep sea corals? Because they're certainly not responding to the same lunar cycles as shallow water corals. Yeah, that's so true. Y'all, um, y'all hear Megan okay? It's real quiet. Uh, really Megan, quiet. you're a little yeah. bit quiet. Super quiet. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I'm just lurking. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, you know, I'm actually not really sure, um, but I, I do know, I think deep sea corals also respond to lunar cycles, not because of the light, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into the, that and yeah, I will hopefully get back to you with a better answer. That's a very good question. Does that look like something we've seen? Uh, can we zoom in on that? Okay. I'm gonna guess Paragorgia. We just finished a ship move, so you've got some time. Okay, thanks. Paragorgia or Swiftia? Okay, Dave. Swiftia. Awesome. Yeah, Swiftia will classically have different color um, skeleton and polyps. So usually like a pink or red skeleton and yellowish polyps. Mm -hmm. Very pretty looking. Yeah. I'm good on that whenever you're ready, unless you want to do some beauty shots. So these are not octocorals. This study was based on uh, scleritarians, but they did found deep sea corals to be seasonal, like you said, Jules. Yeah, very cool. The reproduction cycle. That's be awesome. Se being seasonal. We have a viewer tuning in. Um, some corals brood their polyps eternally. Whoa. Kind of hairy in there. Bonk the camera. That's interesting. Um, yeah, so corals can be male, female, or right. hermaphroditic. Um, so they can um, reproduce. Okay, moving on. Moving on. Uh, I guess self, what is it called? <laughs> self fertilize? Uh, or they can uh, reproduce with other surrounding corals. Um, yeah, once those, um, larvae settle somewhere, <coughs> they begin, uh, multiplying. Right. And they form these, uh, genetically identical, uh, colonies. RVM, ready for another move? Ready. Sure. Bridge, nav. Three zero meters, three one zero. <coughs> Wanna zoom on the fish there, Dave? Fish zoom, fish cam. Ooh. Oh, oh boy. Uh. What is this? Not a cuscale. Not a cuscale. Yeah. Maybe a rat tail. Yeah. Uh, oh, it looks maybe? Good. it got a little flat nose thing. Oh, it's a halosaur? Lizard fish? It's totally a halosaur. Yeah. Yeah. They're all kind of beat up because they seem to constantly be swimming into the ground. <laughs> What is a halosaur? This fish. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Cool. The eel-shaped fishes. Ship moves starting. I got to back down slope here a bit. Oh, to kind of realign this way? Is that what yeah. you're doing? Okay. It seems like the currents died down a little bit <coughs> from yesterday. Yeah. Is that accurate? Yeah. 
It's a lot less particulate moving through the water. Samantha, did you just start a move? Is that what happened? We did, yep. Okay. So a little bit more about uh, coral adaptation to stressors um, and biodiversity, genetic diversity of the host of the coral polyps themselves uh, contribute to the holobiont's stress tolerance. So the stress tolerance of the algae and the bacteria as well, although we know a lot less about um, bacteria associated with corals. Um, there, there is some new research suggesting um, a relationship between the type of coral and the strains of bacteria associated. This is uh, information from a talk I, I attended. Oh, we do have a viewer wondering, was the f weird floaty orb ever identified? I'm wondering, is that the minesweeper? Mm -hmm. I think so. Was it ever identified? Uh, I think it was a tentative identification mm. okay. of a uh, protist, is that right? Right. Yep, the ID we confirmed is on the highlight Radio video, Larian so protist. folks want to check it out in the gallery tab. Uh, it has the ID that was made by our science team ashore there. Awesome. Great. Yeah, it posted 20 hours ago. Megan, I'm worried that people can't hear you, or is it just me? Am I super, still super I can't quiet? Hear you super yeah, quiet. yeah, yeah. Quiet. Let's all pass our COVID tests and take these masks off. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That'll help the mics. Yeah, when are we doing those tests? 12.30 to 12.45. Okay, awesome. Is Okay, I'm gonna put another ship move. Great. Yeah, the Third. mine super Thank radiolarian protests. Check it out Three zero on our meters. YouTube page. Three one zero. EV Nautilus. If you haven't already, please press subscribe. Wow. Their needle-like pseudopods aid in its buoyancy. What's a pseudopod? Pseudo feet, pseudo pod. I think those are the uh, like knobby things. Projections that make it look like a minesweeper. Yeah. Isn't pod uh, the Latin for foot ped. or appendage? Mm. It's ped. Pod. Oh yeah. Ped. ped. Pod is um. Like iPod. Latin no. for music, digital but music player. Like cephalopod. <laughs> <laughs> cephalopod is head foot. Pod. You know what I have stuck in my head? Uh, peduncle. Pa ooh, peduncle. Peduncle. One of my favorite phrases for biology is caudal peduncle. Caudal. Is caudal. 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 C a u d a l. Oh yeah. Caudal. Caudal. Like a caudal fin. Caudal yeah. peduncle. Caudal peduncle. Caudal peduncle. Mm -hmm. I like a modified peduncle. Yeah. Uh, back to coral adaptations and genetics. Um, corals demonstrate a lot of or high phenotypic plasticity, 
and this is key to survival. Okay, you probably need to explain phenotypic yeah. plasticity. Yeah. Uh, so the phenotype of an organism has to do with gene expression. So the genotype are, uh, it's the, the genetic makeup of the Zoom organism, up. but um, the phenotype, the physical characteristics uh, yeah. are of an organism um, there it goes. are uh, <laughs> different uh, different genes can be expressed right basically um, are there waypoints on here uh, not an, maybe yeah and, and this is the, this is important I guess because you don't have the underlay so turned out right yeah oh you know we lost it when it crashed last night I don't think it was reloaded uh. I can try reloading them the waypoints are so far apart, though, that it's not going to be that helpful um, for you. So epigenetics yeah. are it's in general like, like short-term adaptations. Like it can happen over course, the span right? of an you organism's the, life. It's just a big um, blob of blue. And over time, area. Uh, this can be passed down to other generations. I'm just curious, is all. Yeah, so epigenetic changes do not change the DNA sequence, but they can change how an organism reads a DNA sequence. Is there a manual for it? Uh, no, I'm just reading my notes from yesterday uh -huh. to make sure I'm not messing it up. There's certainly so a lot more going on like with that uh, than the, sorry. the older one, right? Yeah. It sounds like that could even be what's happening with uh, Paolo's research with these corals and fireworms. Yeah, it fireworms. actually could be. So, fireworm, that sounds fireworms, ominous. Yeah. Are they oh, wow. fireworms because they're red or because they're stingy? Both actually. Oh. They're red and they're stinky. You don't want them to touch you. Oh. <laughs> they have those stinking cells right there. And Paula, can There's you your share your research yeah. again for our viewers who are just tuning in, please? Yeah, of course. So back in Puerto Rico, we have coral restoration efforts, and those are shallow water corals, so they differ a little bit of what we're seeing here, which are deep sea corals. Yeah, I think you'd um, have to open another like widget to yeah. get like range and bearings to the... Yeah. So shallow water corals depend on light, and on, on our screen. restoration sites back in Puerto Rico, we're seeing a whole outbreak of fireworms. And these are not good this because they <laughs> eat the coral polyps Although, that we're like trying to that restore. Useful, right? like so this, we have been monitoring uh, coral livery, which is uh, coral predation of these fireworms over the last two years. And so far we have found yeah. out that while they do slow coral growth, they improve coral survivability. So that's very interesting. So what Jules was contributing is that maybe it has to do with uh, phenotypic plasticity? Is yeah, that the word? With uh, epigenetics. Epigenetics. Short-term adaptations to stressors. Corals are actually very resilient. Um, as dire as things may look, uh, there is some hopeful, uh, hopeful data suggesting that uh, corals can respond to change. Must, must be more plugins. Yeah. Do we know why there are fireworm right. outbreaks? We really don't know. We m There's a theory that it might have to do with uh, sediment mm -hmm. when it goes off sh like from the shore, mm -hmm. uh, sediment influx, nutrient influx maybe, yeah. but they're not an invasive species. They have been there a long time. Huh. They just from time to time these outbreaks of course. Interesting. I mean, zoom it in looks like a day. sponge. Uh, Rosella day. Actually, I take that back. I think it's you plucked mm -hmm. Okay. And we sometimes yeah. will change that cable out 
uh, but right now the tether is 30 meters. Um, and then between uh, the, sh zoom in, Dave? the ship and the vehicles, that cable is 4,000 <laughs> meters. Well, how oh, much wow. is on the spool right okay. now? It must be over 4,000, awesome. obviously. Yeah, it's over 4,000. 46? I don't remember. Close, close to six. Six thousand total yeah, on there. Close, oh right, close, because we've got six, yeah. Okay, to close to six thousand because we have Little Herc on board. Um, on board now, not just for this cruise, but in the suite. So we have six thousand meters of cable on the on the spool. And in that cable so. is uh, copper conductors for electricity and fiber optic. Oh wow! For can we get a sorry? Can we just get a close up? on the polyp, please. Oh, there's another mollusk down there. Oh, actually, yeah, let's let's well, look at this mollusk. It actually looks like a hermit crab. It looks like a hermit crab. Is this our first hermit Is that crab? All the zoom? That's it. First one. We zoomed I've all the way in. Oh, wow. Oh, we're all zoom the way out. in. I'll try and get closer. I love the polyps on the Umbalula. They're so cool. Now, what is an umbalula? Umbalula is a type of sea pen. Okay. And what is a sea pen? <laughs> is it like uh, related to coral? Sea pens are related corals. Related to anemones? They are corals? They are corals. Uh, they... Live in sediment? They are uh, octocorals. Yeah, a lot of them are found in sediment. Okay, Dave. Um, so they have the peduncle. Peduncle. Sorry, um, which uh, is under the sand, and it keeps them in place. Um, yeah, hermit crab. Hey, hermit. Yay! Yeah, I just love that you can see the the inside of the animal on these. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Nice shot. DJ, I fixed the uh, zoom on. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate so. it. It's real easy. You just, uh, just take it out of manual into auto and then back again. Can we get a zoom on this too, please? Um, sorry, I didn't see you circle. Okay. I guess looks alright. I have a question for the ROV pilots. Can we zoom in, Dave? Later on. Is it when is this watch over? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, like, what's the technique so the ROVs don't blow up the sand substrate and we actually can get a pretty clear picture picture always? Yeah, Skillful piloting. Right. Yeah, that, <laughs> it takes a lot of experience. This sediment is not super uh, blowy. <laughs> There's some places you'll land and poof. Really? Yeah. Is that the scientific term yeah, for that? that? What is it? Flocculants? Flocculants, yeah. yeah. What did you yeah, think this one was? Plexorid? I think that's a plexorid. Okay. Is that good? Or? Yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay. Thank you. So is the general rule when you're using an ROV going backwards or thrusting up is bad as yeah. far as making it dusty? So you try and avoid doing that. And if you do have to do it, then you do it gently. Oh, oh. That's interesting. <coughs> okay, I'm gonna put another move if we're happy. Happy. Yep. Do you think we can go a little faster, ROV? Yep. Bridge, Nav. If you're happy and you know it, make a move. Let's go. <laughs> uh, three zero meters, three one zero. 
Let's increase speed to 0 0.3 knots, please. Everybody hold on, okay? Holding. What's this? <clears throat> Probably another black coral. Yeah, if we do any more stopping, I think we're going to need to bump our uh, recovery time. But Okay, uh, we move. can keep moving. Yeah, we don't have to necessarily make it to the very top. There's no... Dwight also mentioned that if we go to like one, that's okay as well. Okay. Yeah, and we don't have to. We don't have to stop at all of these corals. Um. Samantha likes to get her targets. Y'all yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get the samples. I get the waypoints. <laughs> it's like a sea pen in the sediment. Oh yeah. Collect them all. <laughs> Can probably leave ID at Penatula Day. It's interesting that there was so much more density at the edge of that little plateau than on this slope up. Yeah. I feel like uh, like some of those corals were kind of delicate, like the Metallogorgia. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know what the flow was, but it seemed like there was less flow. Maybe mm. they don't need as much or they don't like as much. There's a star pathies. Yep. And a dead bamboo. A dead bamboo. But it's a great view of the bamboo part. Yeah. Yep can see why we call them bamboos. Oh, and there's a little bit of live coral there. Yeah. Uh, there's some crinoids Just on there. Barely hanging wow. Away. It Just looks like something had a good meal. There. That is a really large bamboo. That's <laughs> super cool. It looks like a fallen one next to it, even. So that's probably been there quite a while, huh? Yeah. yeah for sure. Oh my gosh, we haven't reached the end. I feel like, oh, there we go, okay. I feel like it could recover. I don't know, I'm rooting for it. Um, I'm trying to figure out the species. It looks like internodal. I actually can't see. Close close on it? Yeah, can you get an up close, can please? Zoom in, Dave? Uh, can you go a little bit to the left? Other left. You want to see the skeleton more? Um, there's a, a branching point. Oh. It was more clear. Uh, I think internodal. Internodal, meaning? Between nodes. It branches between the nodes. I'd agree with that. Yeah, okay. I'm good there. Um, Keratoicid C1. I don't know, I'm just throwing that out there, actually. I have no idea. All right, that's what I think is. we're good on this. We're zoom. good, thank you. Yeah, I, it's a keratoicid for sure. C1 is a potential clade. Oh, here's something interesting. Steve oh. gave us a, a, an image of the clades on the oh, shot. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. If it helps. <coughs> okay, yeah. <coughs> I'm not gonna, I don't think I'll get it to clade, but keratoicid and A. Um, oh, I'm looking at nodal, that's why.
We're finishing a move, but I'll let you get ahead a little bit before we... You can zoom in there, Dave. Starfish, I guess. Sea star? Yep. <coughs> yeah, I have no idea on Clade. <laughs> Asteroid eye. Yep. Asteroid. Be kind? I don't know. Gotta go. Keep moving. Go. Okay. No stop till we reach the top. How far? <laughs> <coughs> far. Far? Oh that Oh, not the not the close in guy there. Nope. That's the North North Pacific Ocean. <laughs> yeah, I mean we've got two hundred meters to the top, so I think we need to either make a call that we're going to stay here longer or we're not gonna make it to the top. Um, yeah, well, I, I do want to rock from here, so I think we'll not make it to the top. Okay. So, so have you started the next move? Uh, we have not. So we're after a rock? Yeah, let's, uh, I don't know, this, this looks pretty cemented in here, but, uh, you want to do another move mm. and then let's do another move and cool. see what it looks like. Uh, RV, do you want to get a little farther ahead? Oh, look at that holothurian <coughs> spiky. Ooh, hey. this one's spiky. Uh, on that sea star. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Uh, it could be bentho peptidae. Okay, bridge nav. But the question yeah, is, yeah. Jules, can you leave the ID there for three zero meters? Three one zero. Yeah. That definitely looked like um, it. I'm not certain though. So the question is, do you want to go more specific and maybe correct it later, or yes, go zero more point three, general? Please. Well, I can just say possible C star ID and go as specific as you can. Okay. forget that I use glasses and I don't bring them. <laughs> <laughs> where are your glasses? I don't even know where they are. They're somewhere. Are they with you on the boat? I hope so. I, I think I brought oh. them, but I always forget them. And this is one of the times that I'm like, I, I need my glasses. Oh no. <laughs> are you farsighted? <laughs> um, a little bit, yes. It starts okay. to get very... Got it. Thank you, Jules. Yep. <coughs> mm. Good black coral. Yeah, I was going with telopathies on those ones. Mm. Although it looked a little bit different, maybe a little bit more like umbellopathies. Like I'd go a with little more delicate. Schizopathidae. The uh, schizo. Schizopathidae. Paula, the spelling is up here for the, the black great. coral we just saw. If you need it. Yes. I don't know if I'd go as far as telopathies. I just go with the family name. Oh, okay. So we're living in a schizopathy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Path a day. Path a day. Ooh, what is that floating around? Can we zoom on that really quickly to the left? Got it, Jules. Thank you. 
I think that's a black coral. Yeah. It looked like. Uh -huh. Can we zoom there, I Dave? don't know. Wormy. Yeah, black coral. Yeah, that's a black coral. Okay. Zoom okay. Out. Yeah, Thanks. good. <coughs> What were we calling those parentopathies? No. Yes. Yeah, parentopathies. For our friends tuning in, thank you so much for, well, thank you for tuning in. Um, shout out to everyone. Uh, we have friends from the US, uh, Canada, the UK, Netherlands, Germany, Turkey, Sweden, Portugal, Poland, Norway, Italy, Denmark, Switzerland, and Australia. Wow. Hello, everyone. You guys are amazing. Um, please continue to send in your questions, anything interesting that you see anything that you do want to see um we are um, available for questions Finish that move. Mm -hmm. so Just about ready for another. Well, these rocks aren't looking very. Mm -mm. No, they're not. Mm -mm. Snaggable. Looks like it's time for a push core, though. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> I like a little more rock on the surface yeah. before we. <laughs> another move. 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 Bridge nav. Sound like a move. Sometimes it'll move. surprise three zero you though. Meters, you get a pocket like that and yeah, just it goes go right in. All the <laughs> way down. Swift, yeah. What are you humming about? The little red, red right. guy here, Swift, yeah. <laughs> is the. Is it a hmm zoom? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Not that big. You can prioritize the rocks. <laughs> ah, music to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. <laughs> it only took four hours. <laughs> Finally, we <laughs> can hours. talk about the rocks. That looks like a loose rock. What about that one sitting on, it, on the yeah. top there? Yeah, that's this? the one I'm talking about. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, sure. That's We're doing it. 10 centimeters, yeah. Bridge, Nev. Hold position, please. I just had to make the move, and then <laughs> <laughs> we <laughs> find it. Appears, yeah. Got uh, the starboard forward bin. All right, the big one. Yep.
Can you zoom in, Dave? <clears throat> Sort of looks more in place now, though, doesn't it? Mm. Oh, it tricked us. No. Oh. The rocks tricked us again. First it was the shiny rock. Mm. First it was <laughs> the shiny the rock. Immovable rock. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll move, I swear. It's, it's often like pulling a tooth. you got to work it. But I think that, that too. This that one's a yeah. heavily impacted molar there. <laughs> <laughs> Not a dentist, but you play one on all those slides. <laughs> yeah, if this seamount had been flossing better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we moving? Let's move. Yeah, bridge nav. Let's do two zero meters, three one zero. Is it possible to make things sure. a little brighter? Is that an option? Dave, can you open the iris a little bit? Ooh. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Thanks. It's much better. So I got sidetracked with the uh, file housekeeping over here. Oh, no, no worries. worries. Ooh. Black coral. Metallic orchid, maybe. What do you little, think? Little, that's what it looked like. Little one. I thought it looked like a, a little bit like umbella pathies, but not quite. Well, we do have a question. I think this is for you, Adam. Um, can you tell us more about the geology? <laughs> oh, we have <Yeah>. rocks? <laughs> yeah, so start, we're start got large. An hour left in our ship. We're yeah. in the uh, uh, region <laughs> called the Line Islands. This is a uh, kind of a linear chain of volcanic features that runs from, uh, you know, kind of thousands of miles through the Pacific here very likely related to a mantle plume. The particular area that we're in, it has a bunch of flat top seamounts, mm -hmm. and these are volcanoes Ooh. that reach the surface. They Tops were down. eroded away, and then as the crust cooled, they subsided down beneath the waves. And around these flat top seamounts are a bunch of more conical volcanic seamounts that uh, never reach the, the sea surface. Right. And these volcanoes erupted about 80 million years ago. And over the intervening time, there's uh, been this crust of manganese and iron oxide that has precipitated on the surface. So we're not actually seeing any of the original rock. We're seeing this manganese oxide crust. In the view now, it looks a little bit bumpy. And that's because the crust forms this kind of knobbly texture on the surface. The crust forms really slowly, about half a millimeter to five millimeters per every million years. So wow. sometimes we see it, you know, six centimeters thick, and that means, you know, tens and tens of millions of years of accumulation of this material. And what we're looking for when we pick up these rocks is both that crust on the outside to see its chemical composition because it contains a bunch of uh, rare metals that are in very low concentration in the oceans but get concentrated in these crusts. And then we want to see what's underneath that crust uh, so we can learn more about the volcanic rocks that make up this seamount. Awesome. So, um, you know, for when collecting um rock samples is there a process to tell the age of the rocks or look yeah there's you know qualitatively or you know as a first order guess you can look at the thickness of that crust and estimate how long that crust has been growing but the more precise way to do it is to um, crush up the rock inside mm -hmm. pull out 
some specific minerals and then use radiometric age dating. So wow. the method that's most commonly used for these types of rocks is called argon-argon dating or potassium-argon dating. And uh, when the rock forms, it has a certain amount of argon, but as the potassium in the rock uh, decays radioactively, it accumulates more argon. So by looking at the ratio of uh, potassium to argon, you can tell how long it's since the rock has cooled. Wow. And then that'll also tell you, um, like, maybe a percentage of, like, the type, maybe 90% maybe um, basalt, granite, or... Oh, so yeah, so for the... So, yeah, we, igneous rocks, we kind of classify them based on their chemistry. And, right. okay. you know, one of the main differences is how much silica is in the rock. So a basalt has, you know, kind of 49 to 50 percent mm -hmm. silica. But as but different volcanoes produce different different compositions, like a volcano uh, in a <coughs> arc like the Cascade Arc or in New Zealand or, you know, Chile, Central and South America will have more silica in them. Uh, and then as you look further and further into the details of the chemistry, you can learn quite a lot about how much of the mantle melted, where in the mantle that melting took place, and even, you know, what uh, <coughs> kind of ancient rocks make up that mantle. So it, it's, you know, strong you know, current. Yep. Really useful um, tool to look in to detail at the chemistry. Makes sense since we're getting towards the top. We can also use uh, radiometric dating to yeah, age corals. Current coming down the rock. Um, because yeah. they, like trees, grow outwards. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not uh, so we can take cores. <coughs> and this can also Open tell us um, important things about <laughs> climate and. Um, yeah, temperature and uh, acidity. Do you well, want to try where the crabbing over? Live, right? I mean, well, yeah, well, we, we know falling. where it lived, no, no, but no, we no. can we, like really infer sorry. things about the climate <laughs> in that oh. area over time. Hey, science, I think we're going to need to look around here for a rock. Uh, okay, yeah. RV's not able to make any progress due to a pretty strong current was, coming yeah. over. Okay. Like right. I'm, I'm given everything it's got, it's not budget. And we just finished a ship move, so... So this one in front of us is probably <laughs> too big? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can go starboard, I can't go port. Okay. okay, go starboard. And that might be uh, as far as we're going up the slope if you're not able to fight the current coming over. I mean, the Atalanta <laughs> view looks not like we're at the top of anyway. a little thing, yeah? yeah? Oh, yeah, now we get, there's some stuff there. Okay. Sweet. If we can get to it, that'd be great. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All the way oh, down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jules, what's the coolest sample you've processed over at the museum? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, I really like looking at chrysogorgids because they're just so like delicate and beautiful. Um, I've spent the past few weeks or months maybe, I've gone through every single sea pen in the fluid collection. <laughs> wow. wow. Um, and dry sea pen actually. Um, I've been updating taxonomy, yeah. reorganizing things. Uh, a whole bunch of them weren't in the database, so adding those. Um, yeah, I've I've learned a lot about uh, some of the sea pens, especially like Cophobolemnidae, uh, Bathy Pathidae, um, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah. Hawthorians don't keep well. Really? Yeah. Kind of turn to 
That's well. Oh god. <laughs> You like start at the top of a shelf and go. Wait, this isn't in the database, and then move on from there. How do you how do you approach that reorganization? Yeah, so I kind of work in batches. I'll put a whole bunch of specimens on a cart. I will go through each one. A lot of them need to be put into new jars with new ethanol because they're in Agassiz jars, which often um, aren't sealed tightly enough to prevent evaporation. Um, yeah, so I'll, I have a spreadsheet where I catalog all of these specimens and then I will look in the database for it. I'll look for a catalog number. Some of them have catalog numbers. They're in a ledger, but not the database. Um, so if they're not already there, I I will add them as I go, as I'm cataloging and uh, read. I'm trying to come down a bit lower housing. there just to get a bit of shelter. I'm just getting um, pulled straight. Yeah. Maybe some of that stuff. Yeah, and I'm also updating taxonomy as I go. And then when I'm finished with a batch, I'll print labels with the updated taxonomy and add them to the jars and then uh, move on to the next and organize the shelf as I go. That's sounds like general. sounds like quite a, a an undertaking. Right. I, I'm uh, picturing the the the, uh, the final scene from Indiana Jones. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's exactly that. I'm just like Indiana Jones. <laughs> don't don't open the ark, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a it's a long process. I feel like with every project at the museum, you usually um, kind of snowballs. You like come upon something and be like, oh, this needs to be changed. Like sometimes it has to do with the locality, which uh, can be shared by a bunch of different specimens. Uh, it tells you information about where it was collected and by who and when, um, etc. We need a wrap. I want to rock. Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if we just start hitting them. <laughs> there was. Uh, yeah. I know one of the you viewers said. I, um, I thought better of sharing a story. <laughs> One of the viewers had said, one of these days, Herc will have a hydraulic jackhammer so there are no more attached rocks. Yeah. <laughs> That's been tried. Man. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta have something to push you. need a you permit get. for that? Oh, right? And it shakes the heck out of the sub. <laughs> I saw a couple of comments about the smells of my job. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. There are smells. <laughs> oh. Especially in the fish department. Ooh. I do not enjoy Maybe being in the fish department. The <laughs> yeah. About that guy. The echinoids, for some reason, smell really bad. Uh, the, the shinier black bit there? Yeah. Hmm. Did you say shiny? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just like curves. Attached. Oh, hey. oh, oh! There we, there go. we go. Surprise! Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Let's go. Always go for the shiny ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Are we going into starboard or front? Front. 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 So you got on it there. Oh, oh. 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 Get a what is? Bonus uh, brittle star. Hmm. It's an orange junk. What That's is an that iron that? oxide. Cool. I wonder if you have any cool microbes on there. Can you save me Actually, a chunk? Actually, Elva uh, okay. did request a chunk, of, or somebody requested a chunk of crust for microbial work. Hmm. I guess maybe go into Thank minus you for this, babe. This could be a good one for that. That okay. iron oxide. From the drawer, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come that in with that one now. Switch out. Yeah, it fits. I'm going to try and bump it over a little bit. Do you know what sample number is this? Yeah, I know. This will be That's sample me. 031. Thank you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Not in the hole yet. Big rock. <laughs> uh, they... Yeah. Yeah, Adam, we're about 100 meters off from the top, if that's what Dwight's in here yeah, for. Yeah, but did we have trouble getting... We had some trouble, yeah, but it was on the particular heading. I mean, we could try again if getting to the top is a goal. But. I think this is too aggressive of a rock here. Yeah. Hi, Lilo. Can you flip it? What if we just kind of close it in there? That is too much rock for this part. Too much rock. Oh. Do you flip it? Flip it. Flip yeah. It Go this way, that way. Vertical. I put it here anymore. Oh, I just put, if they're able to put the rock, it will be here. But if not, I'll, I can just so get it. So, Samantha, we're, we're going to not need to get to the very top, OK? Rider. So after this, we can. OK. Sorry. <laughs> this way. <laughs> Which way? Get the skinny part down in the forward part of the box. Yeah. So, Adam, what type of radioisotope dating are you doing with these rocks? Uh, I'm not going to be yeah, doing right any, there. but uh, it, if we we're going to do it, it'd be... Uh, Too much rock. You got it in there now. <laughs> potassium <laughs> or gone. Oh, okay. What's uh, the gonna, reason yeah, for that? Stay in here. Just can you uh, put it on the front of the basket and just put the arm on it? Put Mongo on it for the write-up? We don't call it that. The magnum. What do we call it? The magnum. Magnum. But yeah, I, this is the end of the dive, Robert, so we can <laughs> strap we can it what? down. Uh huh? <laughs> we can what? Oh, hold it to the front of the porch if that's an option. Well, I'm trying to get at it. <laughs> I know, it's letting you know next steps. <laughs> <laughs> now we don't want to get to the target. We want to get on the surface. <laughs> Dynamic 
planning under <laughs> under a time Quit crunch. Quit around with the rock. Yeah. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> All right. Can you put in another ship move at point eight knots? Yeah. <laughs> you just bit off more than you could chew there, bro. <laughs> this is going to be a problem. <laughs> it did fit in there, though. Yes, just like did. I thought. <laughs> and if we move the divider. I don't uh, think it's their boxes. Oh. So close. So why do you use those isotopes? Um, basically because their half-life is uh, long enough to be able to date things in the okay. tens of millions of year range. And okay. potassium oh is no. very common <laughs> in <laughs> these rocks. You took a box. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Oh. oh, come on. Tilt forward. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> you close the box. Yeah. Two or three coming in. Okay. No. Oh. 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 You got to zip tie those boxes yeah. in. You bump it? Yeah. Tilt it forward. Oh. oh. It is wedged in there now. We're going to break our box, too. Come on. There we go. Tool tray coming in. That thing. Are we going to porch out or just. Uh, a vibrant crust there. Yeah, I don't know that I've seen anything quite like that. That's really, it would be cool to see what that is. Good rock choice. Mm What are we calling this thing? The Magnum. Oh yeah, all right. The Magnum <clears throat> Awakens. Hmm. You think you need to ditch any ballast before? Trying to get up quick. Boy, this is pokey. So this is why we don't use this arm very often. <coughs> mm. Although you put a camera in there, you get a nice slow pan. Dave likes that. Yeah.
Watch out for the camera. Oh. It's what? The camera, camera the, sexton. the sexton. I don't think I was hitting it. No, you weren't, but I thought you were, looked like you were. Okay. It's optical delusion. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> optical delusion. <laughs> Hmm. It doesn't have the beans, does it? Doesn't want to open the jaw. Well, it is open. Just not much of a jaw. Definitely looks like an old dinosaur head, huh? Hmm. Yeah, it does. The pal. Uh, shoulder down. Elbow down. Well, we do have a question. Um, can you explain more about precipitation? For instance, is there something about basalt that causes the precipitation of the manganese crust? Well, that's a great question. Um, the manganese crust will precipitate on any hard, sediment-free surface. I think it's in there pretty good right there. So basalt right. makes a, okay. an obvious choice with here. these volcanoes sticking up. Out but out uh, it would precipitate on a fish tooth. Uh, anything like that but oh. you don't see it on the sediment because some of it's not hard but also it moves around quite a bit so it doesn't really have time to to precipitate okay so we're starting our ascent okay Let's do her off bottom Shout out to Maryland. Status. Oh, I put it off, but oh, you did. Nice. Shout out to Maryland. Did you say? Yeah. All right, Maryland. Shout out Maryland. <laughs> well, okay, and then in regards to uh, malt crust, there's a long, another question. Um, do they form on? Oh my gosh, I think I lost it. I said okay. Do crusts form um, on certain substrates or out? only form at yep. depth? Oh, that's a good question. Um, they mostly form at depth, but oh, it's not okay. necessarily a, uh, a product of only the depth. It's it just that it takes such a long time, and our oldest bits of seafloor tend to also be our deepest bits of seafloor as well. Um, but you can find these crusts uh, other places, you know, and, and shower than we are right now and much deeper than we are right now. What's the oldest rock you've you've, you've dated? Uh, the oldest rock... Uh, I tend to mostly work on pretty young volcanic systems, oh, so okay. I don't really... The youngest rock I've dated was uh, like three months old. Wow. Uh, but some of the oldest rocks on the seafloor here mm -hmm. in I the Pacific your Ocean head Basin, off, just leave it be. and uh, over no, Let it go. in the northwest go. part of the Pacific, so yeah. over kind of subducting beneath and Japan I, um, and start uh, coming up. And, wait for you to and the Aleutian Arc. Start coming up. And wait till I get. Can you talk about the trace metals in the rocks? Uh huh. So the the manganese and iron 
um, form these colloids, these kind of uh, complex molecules, and they have a slightly negative or a slightly positive charge for iron, uh, for manganese and iron respectively, and that attracts these metals. They're in really low concentrations in the in the water, but they like to glom onto these colloids, and so they uh, precipitate out with the manganese and, and the iron. Um, and so in these crusts, the, these trace metals, so cobalt, for example, is uh, 10 orders of magnitude more concentrated in the crust than in the seawater, and uh, one or two more orders of magnitude more concentrated in the crust than in any deposit on land. Wow. And that's why these are looked at as uh, potential resources because these rare metals get highly uh, concentrated okay. in these, yeah. these small right. crusts. Are there alternatives to mining them? Yep. Uh, Can we see our speed rubber? So we, there are uh, still we have to get settled here. mines Redder, settled. on land that we, we use. Okay. Um, oh, you're just coming this way. And then there's potential recycling of, of these metals from our old electronics mm. and batteries. Okay. And, uh, you know, mostly it's, uh, as, as often as the case, is a question of economics. Is it cheaper to get new stuff or to recycle the old stuff? Right. And is this an unlimited store? Um, what are the limitations? like the the total magnitude of the deposits there there like if people wanted if we were to rely on these crusts solely for okay. things like electronics um going forward um uh, yeah how many, year, how many years would we have there there's we need pitch plates yeah like could we Harder. do that is that sustainable um, Oops, where am I putting that down? It's no, no, no. possible, right? So there's much more of this in the ocean than in our land-based deposits, at least that we've found. Um, but pretty much no resource on the Earth is, except solar energy, is unsustainable. Oh, you need these these metals to make solar panels <laughs> as well. Um, Great. So it's a it's a complicated story. Yeah. You know, we want we want to kind of get away from a carbon-based kind of economy to a more renewable economy, but we we need these the metals to help us there. do that. So, right. um, you know, ultimately a combination of land-based, marine-based mining along with recycling is probably going to be the solution that ends up being the most sustainable. And maybe, maybe at some point, um, extra planetary mm -hmm. mining as well, you know, mm. other other planets right. and bodies yeah. in the solar system. So, you know, outside of the benefits that we get from these, these crusts, um, they're providing services for the ecosystem itself, right? Yeah, and, and not necessarily the crust themselves, although there, there's some probably microbial communities that that use them as a home, but all the <coughs> critters that we've been seeing right. would happily attach to basalt, manganese crust, mm -hmm. carbonate, anything hard. Um, the problem being that you cannot remove this crust without <laughs> Uh, the disrupting the ecosystem and these also of course, are the so plate. slow growing uh, and so slow to recover that it right, would take a long right. time to come back. Not to mention um, many of the, the species found on seamounts are endemic to those seamounts and may not be found in other places so once it's gone it's Yeah, although I don't gone. I don't know that that, that is as true as we once thought it was like an individual seamount like it seems like so? yeah that that uh there's certainly a regional kind of endemism but 
not necessarily one seamount to another, or at least yeah, I, no. I haven't seen. So the island hypothesis on land definitely makes a lot of sense because right. the ocean is a real barrier to genetic transport. But in the ocean, with these kind of spawning events and, and whatever, it does seem that there's, uh, you know, a medium through which the genes can, can flow. <coughs> but big barriers in the ocean, like the abyssal plain between this or, or passages between one ocean to another seem to have a really strong effect on the biogeography. But uh, I think everything we've seen on these seamounts are you know, throughout the line islands and the central Pacific. I think we're right. going to have to leave it. Right. We're going to fiddle around and lose the rock. And I don't want to... We're just going to be late. So I, I actually really do like thinking about the microbial aspect well, of deep-sea mining. Drop into ones under. Um, so obviously, deep-sea mining will affect the megafauna associated with these rocks. But there hasn't been much research done on the microorganisms living in association really with these rocks no, and to be just the energy and that they really supply the surrounding yeah. environment with. Um, Whatever. Well, the so I think that's going to be really an important area um, to study going forward Sorry, what? so that we can fully understand the, one, the, one plate the effect make, of, make, uh, of taking difference. these rocks out of the ecosystem. Yeah, and uh, you know, we've only begun to scratch the surface of the they let it go. Not just the yeah. microbial community, oh. but the the function of those microbes, you know. Right. And and not just in the deep sea, but in our bodies and in our <laughs> you yeah. know, land based systems. Yeah. It's, it's a pin came on here. Yeah. Must have been the, the Yeah, one. I mean What is that thing you're holding? We released some plates. Oh I see. Is the rock still secure? The rock is secure. Awesome. Rock security. Oh, we can't get the. Uh, we can't get the I'm just gonna hang off. on to this. <laughs> yeah, microbes can be uh, especially hard to to study um, in these extreme environments, but it's also like the most useful place to study these microbes because it can tell us about um, about life on other planets, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and <coughs> we can learn a lot about just the rest of the living things on Earth by, by learning about um, how, how microbes <coughs> uh, metabolize um, chemicals from their surroundings and um, the energy transfer. Yeah, I think one of the things that's uh, kind of impressed me as I've worked in the oceans is how life will find a way to adapt to every available niche on the planet. Right. Even the deepest parts of the ocean. That was a big rock. That get little Big oh, rock, big rock equals you know, come still, up slower. Yeah. <laughs> still microbes that live there. They might go yeah. into like yeah, they're stasis everywhere for and everything. Yes, exactly. We would not exist without them. Thanks for the big rock, guys. Yeah, we've got, um, we're going to definitely have a slower recovery here. So it looks like we're averaging about 17 meters up. Um, which is going to put our recovery to be in an hour and a half. So 12.31 will be uh, Wasn't that what service. was planned anyway? 12.30 was on deck, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so we'll